In this video, we'll measure the step response of a second order circuit and compare our measured peak value, or the maximum value in our response, to our expectations based on analysis. The circuit we'll use in this video is a series RLC circuit, but the approach is similar for any second order system. First, I want to briefly review the analysis of a series RLC circuit. This is the circuit of interest. We're going to apply a step input voltage with amplitude A at these terminals so that the input voltage is zero for times less than zero and A volts for times greater than zero. We'll be measuring the voltage across the capacitor as our output. This is the governing differential equation for the circuit. It's been derived in the textbook and in the lecture videos, so we won't dwell on how we got it for now. If we compare this to the standard form we use for second order differential equations, this term is the square of the natural frequency, and this term is 2 times the damping ratio times the natural frequency. We've seen that the peak response of a second order system to a step input is the amplitude of the input, A, times 1 plus the percent overshoot. The maximum overshoot is e to the minus pi squiggle divided by the square root of 1 minus squiggle squared, where the natural frequency is one square root of 1 over LC, square root of this term, and 2 squiggle omega n is R over L, this term. Here's the circuit we'll be wiring up. We'll use a 10 ohm resistor, a 1 millihenry inductor, and a 0.1 microfarad capacitor. The waveform generator will apply a 2 volt square wave with a low enough frequency to appear to be a step function for all intents and purposes. We use channel 1 of our oscilloscope to measure the capacitor voltage and channel 2 of the oscilloscope to measure the input voltage. For these values of resistance, inductance, and capacitance, our expected natural frequency is 1 times 10 to the fifth radians per second and the damping ratio is 0.05. This means that we expect the overshoot to be about 85% of the steady state response. Since the steady state response of the capacitor voltage is 2 volts, the maximum response we expect is about 3.71 volts. Here's our circuit. This is our resistor, our capacitor, and our inductor. We're using channel 1 of the waveform generator to apply power. Ground is down here. Channel 1 of the oscilloscope is measuring the voltage across the capacitor. Channel 2 of the oscilloscope is measuring the input voltage. Now let's apply power to the circuit and measure its response. As I mentioned before, we'll use a square wave to create a step input. The circuit natural frequency is fairly high, so I can use a relatively high input frequency, 500 hertz. Per my previous analysis, I want my input wave to go from 0 volts to 2 volts, so I set my amplitude to 1 volt and my offset to 1 volt. Now on my oscilloscope, I've used a time base of 50 microseconds per division on the time. And my vertical scales on both channel 1 and channel 2 are set to 500 millivolts per division. I'm going to trigger my acquisition off of the square wave on the input. So I've selected my source as channel 2. I'm using a rising edge trigger at a level of 1 volt. Applying power and acquiring the data, I have a maximum value of about 3.4 volts. To get a closer reading for that, let's open up the measurement. My channel 1 maximum is 3.44 volts. Now let's compare our measured value to our expectations. We measured our peak response to be 3.44 volts. This gives us a percent error between our expected and measured values of 7.3% where I define percent error as the difference between the expected and measured values divided by the expected value. This is actually pretty good agreement for a dynamic measurement. DC values tend to be much easier to predict than time varying values since they depend on fewer quantities. I'm generally pretty happy if I can predict a dynamic quantity such as overshoot or rise time to within about 10 or even 15 percent of my measured value. Now there are a couple of effects that we can include which could improve our predictions. For example, our inductor may have a non-negligible resistance, which we should include on in our analysis. When I used an ohmmeter to measure the resistance of the inductor, I got about 2.5 ohms, which is significant compared to the 10 ohm resistor we're using. If I include this 2.5 ohms in my calculations, adding it in series, of course, consistent with our previous non-ideal inductor model, I get an expected response of 3.64 volts which gives us an error of only 5.5%, which is very good agreement. 
We could also probably improve our prediction by measuring the actual inductance of the inductor and using that in our calculations instead of the nominal value we're using now. But since most of us don't have access to an inductance meter, we won't attempt that. 